This is Harry Littman of Talking Feds. Welcome to the latest episode in our Talking Books franchise. We're here at the Texas Tribune Festival with a celebrated son of Texas, as well as one of the nation's most accomplished person of letters, both fiction and nonfiction. That would be Lawrence Wright. Uh, he's the author of 11 works of nonfiction, including his tour de force, The Looming Tower, Al-Qaeda, and The Road to 9-11, which won the Pulitzer Prize, and the New York Times bestseller, Going Clear, Scientology, Hollywood, and the Prison of Belief. I'll just do a little editorial insert to say many of you have read The Looming Tower, but this, the Going Clear is a really fabulous uh, book, whether you begin it with an interest in Scientology or not. Um, Wright has returned to fiction now with Mr. Texas, a, here I, we're on video, so, a rollicking novel that introduces us to a colorful array of characters who seek to navigate the politics in the Lone Star State. Um, it's at once a kind of Mr. Smith comes to Washington political romance featuring the political naive Sonny Lamb a picaresque novel of charming rogues and scoundrels like the Machiavellian lobbyist J.D. Sparks, and a political satire in the tradition of Jonathan Swift or Robert Penn Warren. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Lawrence Wright to Talking Books to discuss Mr. Texas, thanks for joining. Thanks, Harry. I appreciate that introduction. I like <laughs> I like being linked with such yeah, legendary like, figures uh, as you listed there. <laughs> John, I thought about Candide too, but I thought yeah. of, you know getting too too uh, too Tony, too pointy headed. Um, I want to start with the traditional sense that comes through in the book, even though Texas politics is changing, and that's kind of a th sub theme. Um, but the traditional sense of uh, Texas politics as Sonny confronts it may be embodied by figures such as um, uh, Sparks and Speaker Big Bob Bigby. But there's a sense, um, and it's reinforced in your writings about Texas, especially that big New Yorker piece from a few years back, of Texas as having in its idiosyncratic way a kind of functional bipartisan system that manages to get things done in a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours uh, mm -hmm. way, even, uh, in other words, while giving play to the most, to base power politics. Is that your view of at least traditional Texas uh, politics? The state has been a beacon for business, mainly because no income tax. And uh, that continues to lure lots of rich people you know, to, uh, to Texas. And then along with them come companies and jobs. And so Texas has done a wonderful job of creating opportunities. And, but it hasn't recently done a very good job of creating community. You know, the sense yeah. of disunity that is spawned in the Texas legislature and our, and our leaders seem so in, in, embroiled in culture wars that uh, they've drifted away from kind of pr pragmatic and compassionate uh, politics of the past into something else that is not serving our state very well. Yeah. And at least the pragmatic part does come through it was a bit of a revelation to me you know, I, I have the sort of outsider's view of LBJ or whatever. I hadn't seen it as a pinnacle of a certain model of effective um, bipartisanship. Um, let me ask you this. Um, to, so to the extent you, you're chronicling the kind of decline, uh, and especially as driven by the culture wars, to what extent were you are thinking of the book as an exposition of American politics as a whole rather than Texas in particular. It's very much on my mind, Harry, yeah. because Texas is the future of American politics. I don't care what you think about it. By 2050, it'll be the size almost of California and New York combined. Each of those states lost an electoral vote in this last census, and, get, and they both were gained by Texas. That's the trend, and it's been going on for decades. And it, it's instead of slowing down, it has speeded up. You know, the pandemic in particular, you know, suddenly, you know, this surge of, of Texans, new Texans coming from, you know, one out of four, I think, is from California. And then, you know, New York and Florida and other places like that, but they're just streaming into the state. And it has wildly important consequences politically 
um, you know, for one thing, most people are moving into the cities and uh, cities in Texas are all blue. Uh, Fort Worth was the last to fall, but, you know, and it wavers, you know, yeah. but uh, so that and it's now a majority minority state. So those Texas is now a majority minority yes, state. Yeah. So in that sense, it really is also the the, the future. Of yeah, American it, it is a template. Yeah. But also, you know, and I, I think it's great. I, you know, I like I welcome the challenge. But on the other hand, I don't think Texans have taken in quite how consequential uh texas is and and the responsibility we as texans to assume the burden of leadership that for good or ill is being put on our shoulders and i just want to uh reinforce or make sure i heard that datum right so you know you think it's on election night in the big is it 55 in california and next te texas in 2050 will have more electoral votes than new york and california combined right so yeah unreal well, it's, uh, it is real. That's, yeah, the, that's exactly. the thing you yeah. have to take in. <laughs> and, you know, we, yeah. we are, you know, I, I think the spirit that uh, has always embodied Texas, you know, is a good thing. And I think, you know, the, the sense of opportunity that, I mean, that's what brought our family here. Uh, you know, the jobs and, you know, the kind of freedom to, but, you know, the intolerance that has begun to take over the state is 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 hampering our forward progress and our social progress for sure. Yeah, and talk about a national trend. But so let me stick with that for a second because there is this flavor that comes through. I mean, it's expressed in the book of a kind of back then mm -hmm. uh, that the politicians feel, I, I, I have the, the quote, if, if I have it right, is, um, when everyone was tougher, more enlightened, crazier, dumber, hornier, and greedier, and a lot funnier. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's a kind of mythology that obtains in a lot of important institutions, but but that pervades your sense of, of Texas, that there was this, you know, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago when probably a lot of, you know, old white sons of Texas, whatever, were were maybe more um, colorful or whatever, but they somehow got the job done with less mean spirit. Is that a, a sort of fair way to put it? I think there is always a mean streak in Texas. Yeah. It depends on how predominant it was. You know, uh, Alan Shivers, for instance, uh, back in the 50s, uh, was governor and he seemed, you know, it, he broke the spell. It was a very mean spirited yeah. uh, state. And, you know, before that, we had our Ku Klux Klan era. And, you know, Texas has gone through periods where, uh, you know, the hatred that uh, of others uh, and the fear of change was, you know, that's what was steering the ship. But we've also had, you know, long periods of relatively progressive politics. And also one thing that is notable that until recently, I would say until the Paxton trial, uh, Texas has been notedly not corrupt. I mean, uh, you know, we only impeached one other statewide individual in the entire history of the state, and that was uh, James Pa Ferguson yeah. in 1917. And voters then elected his wife, Ma, <laughs> to the job. So apparently, it didn't the Texans didn't much care uh, what happened to uh, cause that impeachment. But, and, and what about the LBJ era, which you know the Cato book or whatever? I think in common. Um, uh, imagination. It's sort of like corrupt, but everyone's corrupt or, you know, vote stealing and the like, or is that really overplayed or inaccurate? Uh, no, Carol has it right about, you know, there yeah. were, you know, there was a lot of vote stealing going on. Yeah. And uh, so the fact that Lyndon Johnson engaged in it and actually won because right. of it. Uh, right. His was first a, election, apparently, out of, right? He, yeah. yeah. He, uh, he, the, the, Box 28, I think it was, or something like that. But he lost by, I mean, he won by like 77 votes. Yeah. And they all came out in Star County. And uh, so it's, you know, and that sort of thing doesn't really happen these days. Right. Um, I think, you know, the the laws have been good in Texas. The, you know, the, the sense of, you know, one reason businesses come here, I think there's not a lot of under the table dealing. But I fear that that might be changing. You know, the the tolerance of cor political corruption that we've just seen, I think, is uh, is a bad sign. 
And we'll definitely talk about the Paxton uh, impeachment. Um, let me ask you this, though, the sense of, a, of an emerging meaner spirit and uh, the kinds of problems that plague the, the nation. Uh, what's its connection to what is clear from the book is an emergence of, of a new and more diverse group of political figures? You know, you mm -hmm. have in Mr. Texas some pretty prominent a young uh, Hispanic uh, woman of, yeah. of uh, you know, n who's not well to do, and is that is there a kind of cause and effect of their emergence and the and the nastiness of the old guard, or would you call it just a coincidence? How how does it uh, dovetail, if at all? I think the Republican Party has long been frightened of the, the yeah. turnover into. Uh, white minority status and doing everything they could to restrict the vote and, you know, try to put a, a bridle on the people that can vote in the state. And um, I only wish that, it, you know, that we could get past that era. Um, but my favorite political body is the Texas House of Representatives. And I'm very fond of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because every two years, every other year, a, a new class comes, and you know. So, and this is like my hero, Sonny Lamb. Right. You know, he's he is it's it's not Mr. Smith goes to Washington. It's Sonny Lamb comes to Austin, and that mm -hmm. happens. Every, you know, every year. I actually just, wanted to ask you that because in some ways he seems like a foil, so sort of pure and 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 out so much an outsider. But in fact, Sonny Lamb's. Do come to Austin as They work. do. And, yeah. you know, uh, and you look down, you know, if you're sitting up in the galley, it, it, the the House of Representatives is a beautiful room. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. uh, it, you got these old plantation shutters and the light streams through and these slatted blinds. And, you know, the, it's it's just a redolent of Texas history. And, uh, and you look down on the floor and there are, you know, you know, ex NFL players or, you know, f former mayors or, you know, billionaires or teachers or, you know, worker party people, you know, just and they're all representing their constituents. And so it's like the entire state in a concentrated form. The Senate, on the other hand, is is uh, a captive body and, you know, it's, it's not as nearly as diverse. There's only 31 of them, but uh, but it's. Um, uh, you know, it's overseen by the Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick, and he has uh, another figure to whom we'll yeah, return. Yeah. He, he seems to have held that body captive. But uh -huh. uh, what I what I was inspired by and when I was working on Mr. Texas is by the diversity uh, and the need for compromise between peoples that are very different from each other, have different needs and serve different kinds of people. And in, in Texas is an incredibly diverse state. You know, it's not just cowboys out in West Texas or oil men in the middle. And, you know, right. it's, you know, it's got in many ways, it's as diverse as maybe five different states. In fact, there's a when Texas came into the union. Uh, we reserve the right to split into five entities, literally. <laughs> and yeah. then you would have 10 Texas senators. So, <laughs> you know, it might be more than we asked for. Ted Cruz times 10. Um, yes, that really comes through with Sonny. He's from a pretty rough, um, dry area of the state that seems on, on the one hand kind of God forsaken, but there's the affection. That's the other thing I think of Texas. People, people, you know, There are a few states that people just – really, you know, have it stay in their heart. All right. I had one last question about old Texas before we sort of fast forward. There's a scene uh, where uh, after Sunny arrives where there's a fundraiser held and a bunch of lobbyists just give him a check like at a wedding or a bar mitzvah and uh, including the biggest one of all. I gather that I mean, you didn't make that up, right? No. That was that, that <laughs> That's was the a, way it's done I, in Texas. Yeah, still, yeah. Uh, it used to yeah. be that um, you know you get money any time of the year, but yeah. um, there was a moment of I think it might have been in the early '80s when this chicken tycoon, Bo Pilgrim, walked out on the floor of the state senate and passed out ten thousand dollar checks to his supporters, 
And so you have to, you know, I'm, I'm glad it wasn't done under the table. It was, but it was, right. it was flaunted. And, yeah. uh, and then they, you know, through chagrin, uh, they changed the law that you cannot accept uh, money during the session. So up to the point that the, the session convenes uh, and it, there's, it comes in a rush in the last couple of weeks uh, before the uh, beginning of the legislature, Lobbyists will line up by the dozens, by the hundreds. Uh, and in the Austin Club is where I said it. And, you know, they have to want and they hand over these checks. And the assumption is that they just want access. You know, they give them a, a check of is a, is a gesture of good faith. Mm -hmm. But that's how, you know, the offices support themselves. You know, the 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 senators and representatives don't get very much money for maintaining their offices or their, you know, their offices in their hometowns and stuff like that and their pay for staff and their need for travel. So all of that is, you know, provided by these checks that come in from lobbyists. There you go. Um, all right. I want to ask you just a few um, questions about the writing process. Uh, first, I know you've been living with this project in different incarnations for a long time. Yeah. Um, how did you come up with the idea for Mr. Texas, especially since it predated some of the uh, current trends that, that uh, concern you? And how did they sort of change over time? The, well, the, the character. This began back in the Ann Richards era, right. you know, a long time ago. And back then, Texas was a Democratic state. And my hero was a Democrat. Oh, Sonny Lamb. Sonny Lamb yeah. was a Democrat back then because yeah. most people. People were, yeah. and uh, so, uh, and that changed. Uh, you know, Bush came in, and uh, and but Speaker uh, of the House was Pete Laney. He was a Democrat, cotton farmer from the Panhandle, and uh, the Lieutenant Governor who runs the state Senate was Bob Bullock, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. flamboyant, uh, difficult, complex, lovable, hateable figure that I modeled my big Bob on. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had five wives. That's just an indication of the kind of turbulence. Serially, I hope. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he, was, he, had, he was a terrible alcoholic. He, he worked really hard to overcome that. But he loved Texas and everybody knew it. And that was the salvation of, of the state in many respects because you know there was this genuine sense of commitment and, and affection for the state. And so uh, bad laws had a hard time getting past Bob Bullock. Right. And, uh, and as they did Big Bob, Big B. I mean, there's some fantastic scenes there with Sparks and, and uh, Big B, who has some secrets of his emerge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and how, did I, you know, it's remarkable your, um, you know, the, you're being a double threat in your prowess in both nonfiction and fiction. You know, you're, you've largely written nonfiction. I think eleven nonfiction books, and this is your second novel. Do you have, is is there a sort of distinctive feel to moving from nonfiction to a novel? You're getting up and working in the morning. Is it like does it feel different being in a novel mode, as it were? It, to some extent, but not as much as you might imagine, because uh, my process is very similar. I research a lot. Yeah. I, you know, I like to know what really happens. And if I'm writing a nonfiction book, typically the question is what happened? And if I'm writing a novel, it's like what could happen? So there's yeah. a difference in the verb for it. <laughs> you know, it's it's but researching it is is key and understanding exactly for instance, you know, if I'm writing a hypothetical story about this rancher from West Texas coming to Austin, well, where does he come from? You know, so I go out and you you know, you, the, you, been, you visited. Oh basically, yeah, like and uh, Mary Carr Country or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah. then um, I've spent a lot of time in the legislature and talked uh -huh. to a lot of uh, members of the legislature and got their stories and talked to them about you know. The problems they faced when they, you know, came into office, you know, how much of allowance do you get and stuff like that, you yeah. know, just the bare details. And and I talked to a lot of lobbyists 
and uh, it it all makes it easier to make up a story if you know how it should go. Gotcha. And I I, I just I also want to say there's a kind of literary um, loveliness to the prose. I, it's also true in turn in the, some of the turns of phrase in your nonfiction, but. I could have chosen anything, but just at random, you know, that we're, you're talking about um, Lamb, Sonny's uh, uh, father who he visits in prison, and you write, against the bare white walls and prison pallor, his bright blue eyes appear disembodied like blueberries on unbaked pie crust. That's that's a really nice <laughs> turn of phrase that might have been in a, in a, in a novel. Um all right, and just so one last question about the sort of writing process for you, because uh, it it came it comes apparent that you are among your many interests, you're a, a pretty damn serious amateur musician, and there's a kind of a musical version for which you've written a, many of the songs yeah. of of Mister uh, Texas. So I just wanted to ask you about you know the role of music in the book, or maybe as you see it in Texas. Um, politics and this this project that that is sort of a musical audio book. How has it kind of transformed the whole um, narrative? Well, you know, this has this story has a long tail. Yeah, and uh, it was a gonna <laughs> it be wasn't going to be a play, right? It or? was gonna, it was going to be a movie uh, script. Uh huh. It was a movie script, but no movie came with it. And then uh, <laughs> yeah, like a, most movie a script. friend of mine yeah. said, why don't you make it a play? He was a director. And he said, uh, the next sentence was, we've already rented the theater. <laughs> 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 no <laughs> pressure, yeah. Larry, but four months right. later, we had a yeah. production and uh, we had two productions in Austin and a Broadway producer came down, uh, Margot Lyon, you know, venerated figure on yeah. Broadway. And she uh, she said it should be a musical. So I started writing music with Marsha Ball, who's a revered uh, musical figure in in Texas. And um, and then Margot changed her mind and said it should be a television series. So I wrote a pilot for HBO, and then they fired my executive and dumped all his projects. And so during the pandemic, I, you know, I, I was so panicked. I wanted to do something with it, and I asked my Agent, what should I do with it? He said, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, right. So, you know, as you are experiencing this right now, Harry, you yeah. know, podcasts are not meant to have a cast of 15 right. and, you know, a full band and stuff yeah. like that. It's supposed to be two guys sitting at a table talking, right? right? So uh, that was impractical. It's like we built a ship in the basement and we couldn't get it up the steps. <laughs> and uh, so then I realized, wait a minute, I can write it as a novel. I know I can do that. And as a matter of fact, all of that labor um, made the, it, Wasn't de wasted. it yeah. deepened the, yeah. the story. But I have not given up the idea that I'm going to put this into a musical form. And we've recorded, I think, eight of those songs that we wrote. And and the, you wrote fairly fair enough, no? I mean, I I wrote and with with the assistance of my son and Marsha, uh -huh. and uh, we had the, a creative explosion. I can't tell you. I just love that experience so much, uh -huh. and want to go back to it. But one day, I want to see this on the on the musical stage. Yeah, the radio part almost feels like you know a '30s or '40s kind of drama with all the all the figures uh, yeah. coming in. Um, yeah, well, it's, it really is a story in it, in itself, the story of the story. Um, I still want to, but let's return to Texas politics with a focus on the current landscape and maybe the, the, the point you've made about the, the resonance with the country as a whole. So, um, here's something that comes through in the novel you, you, and I, I think we've talked about it a little bit already, but. A whole lot of people you write in high positions know the danger we're in, but they're afraid to step up, afraid of being targeted. Hell, it's the same all over the country. Texas has spread everywhere. And I guess my question is, has? Do you see Texas is spreading everywhere or Trumpism having spread everywhere and infiltrated Texas? If that I think sense. both things are true. Yeah. You know, a lot of the cultural war stuff originated here and, you know, has been carried. But, you know, it, can, you, it, can you elaborate on that a little? Well, you know, the gun laws, you know, I think mm -hmm. the abortion, you know, they, it, you know, like with abortion, it's interesting because 
Jane Rowe, Ro, you know, yeah, was well, from, right. it was from, from yeah. Dallas. And uh, so that case uh, was started, you know, uh, a legal abortion. And then the case that brought legal abortion to an end also started here at that public policy thing down the street from where we're talking right yeah. now. So, you know, the the history of abortion in America has always been a, a, a matter determined by what's going on in Texas. And, you know, there are other things like that, but, you know, if you put guns and abortion together, then Texas has a big stamp on it. And, uh, and it's, it's really good. It's, I'm also thinking of prayer in public places. That's yeah. Big Texas well, they're working right. hard on that. Yeah. And, you know, the, uh, yeah. we had all the stuff about gender bathrooms and trans, you know, it's not that it's unique, you know, other states are, are, are doing similar things, but, uh, I think, you know, Texas pioneered a lot of that. And, uh, and then Trump, well, you know, Trumpism has destroyed normality in our political system. And, um, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, the Ken Paxton episode is a, is a, a byproduct of that. I, I see what happened with him uh, getting off from the, the, those many impeachment charges as being a, a kind of prefiguring of Trump's encounter in the courts this coming year. I don't know that he'll get off of every charge, but I, I do think that there's a sense in the country that nothing is normal anymore. And, uh, you know, for many people, crimes don't matter. It's the it's the force of his personality and the sense of alienation that they identify with. And, uh, and that's terribly corrupting. So let's stick with this for a bit. Uh, and I'll just add, by the way, you know, Trump now, so much of the story is these dual uh, arena that don't really interact, the political one where he's waging everything and the actual legal one. But Paxton, I think it's a matter of public record, continues to be under investigation. Yeah. So and so his his day of being, uh, you know, criminal defendant may still come. But, yeah, you had written that. um you know, that that impeachment trial will reveal, I think is how you put it, you know, prospectively, if Texas is corrupt, that, yeah. which is a pretty strong way to put it, right. right? Not if he, but if Texas is. So, um, and we've brought up, or at least the, the name Dan Patrick has appeared so far. Can you, um, assuming you stick by that statement retrospectively, what is it about the impeachment that, that seems to, to you to have such panoramic implications for Texas qua Texas. I think, you know, in the past, you know, we've always had, you know, heavy handed politicians. Yeah. But uh, this was such a consequential trial. This is our attorney general uh, who, by the testimony of the people that work for him, had sold out to, you know, a, pr a private developer and essentially yeah. turned over the keys of his office and accepted gratuities in, in, re in response to that. So, you know, by my lights, that's an abuse of his office and probably crimes. So, and that was the way the House of Representatives saw it. Yeah. It was an overwhelming impeachment vote. Including, and the way the people of Texas see it is, I got it, some like 70%, is, is that, that's, I, I read, I don't know. Most people yeah. thought that, that he's a, Paxton, he's a crook. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, most Republicans, by an overwhelming vote, voted to impeach yeah. in the House. And it seemed like uh, with such a mandate that it would be similar in the, in the state Senate. Well, what you have to understand about the state Senate is not an independent body anymore. It is a, you know, it's a theater for, for Dan Patrick to exert his influence. And I don't know what happened to uh, the independent spirit of certain political figures, but it it is remarkable how uh he so he rolled the actually uh, let me ask you because i think some people will know about the paxton trial but not necessarily dan patrick who he is etc can you just give his his you know sort of mustachioed role in this uh, whole drama dan patrick was uh, uh he he owned some sports bars in houston and then he uh got a radio station and he got rich because he was uh, wise enough to take on 
uh, Rush Limbaugh at the beginning of his career. And so that, you know, vaulted his radio station into the top rank in Houston, which is a very rich environment. And the um, Patrick was a shock jock on radio and in the in this sort of Rush Limbaugh fashion. Yeah. And uh, he had some mental problems. He, he tried suicide a couple of times. and He, he struggled personally. And then he got elected by a large majority. People listened to his show. And, you know, and he had a, <clears throat> like so much of Republican uh, politicians right now, he had grievances were his specialty. Right. And he began to affiliate uh, with certain moneyed characters in Texas, and uh, including this doctor in, uh, in Houston who uh, had a show on, on Patrick's radio station, so they're sort of in business together. Um, and he's vehemently anti-gay and uh, talks about homo Nazis and stuff like that. And, you know, he's uh, one of the most retrograde figures in our state. And uh, so he was one of the primary funders of Dan Patrick, still is as far as I know. And, you know, those influences um, came in with Patrick. His first term uh, in the state Senate, he was actually kind of a responsible member, uh, especially in the education department. You know, he but he was he was had a larger constituency than the people he represented. Yeah. And uh, so uh, when he became speaker, he just accumulated so much power. Uh, and it's not... And how did he exercise that power in the Paxton trial? What was his role? Well, according to the reports and Wall Street Journal in particular, yeah. backstage maneuvering and pressure on uh, individual senators whose whole future would depend on uh, their vote, uh, you know, they would be primary. They would not be able to get any of their bills through. They would be, you know, sent into the wilderness. So, you know, that's the source so of his power. So he was the brass knuckles. Yeah, and so for you know, they didn't need that many votes. Uh, for one thing, uh, Paxton's wife Angela is a, <laughs> is a senator, and she was uh, not allowed to vote, but she was allowed to be present. And by that, it was essentially voting because it, yeah. re, you know, reduced the number of of, of, of senators that uh, were required to um, to vote not guilty, and so um, and there were always going to be senators who were going to vote for Paxton. There, you know, some of them very close friends, and you know, Paxton had long affiliations in the state. He had served in the state Senate himself. So uh, there was there was that. And um, but basically, you know, Ken Paxton and Dan Patrick are the the people most identified with Donald Trump in the state. Uh, Patrick had been Trump's campaign manager in the state in his first race. And, uh, you know, Paxton was there on January 6th. Uh, so, you know, if you were to say who are the most conservative people and the closest to Trump in the state, those two men would come to mind. So if you want to talk about is there Trumpism after Trump, that's where it would really start in uh, Texas. Let me, I, I want to finish up by just sort of getting back to this. Um, Can I go back to the Trumpism after Trump? Of course. I don't think there is Trumpism after Trump. Please. You yeah, know, if yeah. you look at somebody like Ron DeSantis who yeah. tried to put on that robe, uh, it doesn't fit him. And, uh, you know, I don't think that there's anybody out there that can be Donald Trump. And that's what makes him such a unique figure in our political history is nobody's ever done this. And to this country, can you imagine? Yeah. You know, you can think of it happening as it has happened in Venezuela Turkey or some. Or yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But, um, I, you know, it, it's spectacular what he has accomplished. And I think that, you know. People have learned if there's one thing that Trumpism has taught uh, political leaders, uh, well, let's say there are two things. One is people bow down to strength and uh, and they surrender their their integrity rather easily. And and secondly, there's no longer any breaks on moral behavior. 
you know, it's 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 striking to me what especially the Republican Party has allowed itself to become. Just unbelievable. Starting with which, you know, a basic idea of like what is true or not. Um, well, let me just push back on you a little bit because I think it's something that's very much part of the conference. Let's say he's a singular um, individual and let's say he's vaporized painlessly uh, and no longer on the horizon. Still, you, if you look at the institutions themselves, the, uh, you know, I just the 10 people who voted for impeachment in the in the House of Representatives in Washington, eight of them are gone. The the uh, power of people who are not Trump, it's true, but but have his playbook in in national figures. The I'm you know I have a little, kind of a law enforcement background and degree to which law enforcement is sort of you know uh, skittish and stays its hand. So the argument would be even even if. Uh, there's no figure to replicate his charisma, brazenness, and absolute absence of any um, moral breaks. The um, political and cultural structure of the country have, has been sort of um, perverted in such a way that his disappearance wouldn't solve everything that ails us. So pushing it on in that respect, you still you still think like, let's let's stick with this hypo, vaporize yeah. painlessly. Yeah. All right. Uh, and you think we're basically, you know, OK. If, uh, no, let's, let's may put it this way. Yeah. It's like the ship of state. You yeah. know, Trump has altered its course and. And it takes a long time to turn a ship around, yeah. you know, but uh, but as long as his hand is on the wheel. Uh, even from outside of office, you know, the ship of state is headed in a, in, in a dangerous direction. And uh, I mean, he's touting it. He's he's pointing to the rocks that he's going to yeah, crash yeah. into. So, uh, it, you know, once he's off the scene, you know, the residue of, you know, the people that follow him, the people that act like him, the people that feel entitled to behave in public in ways that you would never have associated. Yeah. With uh, you know highly elected high elected officials, um, that that may continue for a while, but I think that you know there there will be uh, a, a pushback. Uh, you know there will be people that you know long for decency again, and and you know the progress will have to be made. You know we can't we can't just sit around in in, in the community of nations and think that we're always going to be at the top. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of things to concern ourselves with, and and we're not paying attention because our minds and our votes are all going in the wrong direction. Well put. All right, so let's bring it back uh, where we started to Texas, and uh, you know the how how that the that these cluster of issues effectuate. So. My sense from the book and from your um, reporting in, in in different venues is there's a couple things that are different with Texas from how they were in this idiosyncratic but roughly effective uh, two, you know two party um, arrangement from before one the meanness that has um, emerged and seems not not simply in the legislature but really in the social. Um, fabric, and then two, and maybe this is a countervailing, you know, um, progressive force, but the change in the new politics of Texas and the way it's anchored in younger, more diverse uh, figures, et cetera. So layering those two points on, do you uh, feel sanguine about the prospects for a return to some kind of Fair-minded, effect, pragmatic. I think was a very good word you mm. used. Uh, two-party system in Texas's future, and will will grant, uh, you know, Trump's uh, having exited the stage. I think Texas does best when it has divided government, and the last time that we really had that was when uh, Pete Laney was speaker and Bob Bullock was uh, lieutenant governor and Bush was the uh, governor, and it was a Laney and Bullock uh, voted. I mean, they they endorsed Bush for president, right? For president, right, right yeah. A different party. Yeah. But it was. I mean, I think that helped Bush immensely. 
for sure. It added to his status. And uh, wow, you know, look at where we are now. Yeah. Uh, but that thank you, Texas. <laughs> yeah, that was a moment uh, in yeah. national politics that where sure, yeah. you know Texas was an exemplar of uh, bipartisanship and effective government. I, I mourn the passing of that. The book is Mr. Texas. We've used it to focus on Texas politics and national politics, but it is maybe beyond anything else. Just a great read, a great imaginative, interesting story with a host of colorful characters, and I highly recommend it. Uh, Larry's very well-known chops as a terrific writer are in, on display throughout. So, Mr. Texas, thanks so much for Thank you, talking Larry. to us about it. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.